Stress analysis using photoelasticity. Fundamentals of photoelasticity. In this unit, the fundamentals of the photoelastic technique are presented. The objective is to introduce the phenomena that constitute the basis of this type of experimental stress analysis. The approach is elementary, using a qualitative viewpoint. In further units, a more detailed analysis of different applications will be performed. The contents are as follows. In the introduction, we will present the photoelasticity as a technique for stress analysis. Then, the phenomena of polarized light and birefringence, which are essential to understand the photoelastic method, are discussed. Finally, some examples are shown. In order to carry out a mechanical design, it is necessary to know the stress field of a component subjected to mechanical loads within the elastic range, such as the components shown in the figure. Ideally, the highly stressed points must be detected, and to do so, there are several alternative methods to evaluate these locations. The first is the use of theoretical and analytical methods. This approach is the oldest, although the, its extent of applicability is very reduced. We cannot ignore that an elastic problem is usually complicated and its analytical solution may be very difficult to obtain. Moreover, the assumptions regarding the applied loads and constraints are usually very restrictive. Another technique is the use of numerical methods, for example, the finite element method. The application of these techniques has increased tremendously in the last decades thanks to the progress in the computational capabilities. They are very adequate for the initial design stages because they can solve problems with very complicated geometry, combine several materials, etc. However, the current modeling of the applied loads and constraints is usually a serious difficulty. Contrary to what it seems, this stage is not simple at all and the assumed simplifications can lead to solutions that are very different to the true component behavior. Using experimental techniques. In this approach, the extensometric technique, as shown in the picture, and photoelastic methods are the most widely used. Their great advantage is that the component stress analysis is very close to the real behavior, because it doesn't need to simplify the geometry, loads nor constraints. Therefore, the results are preferred by the analyst and practitioner when designing a mechanical component. Their main disadvantage is that a model or prototype needs to be available or built on purpose. Photoelastic techniques are applicable to two-dimensional models that represent the component to be analyzed. For example, the figure shows a section of a crankshaft model. Another example is the analysis of a gear tooth under load. The so-called isochromatic lines can be observed. These lines indicate the stress level at each point of the component under the applied loads. In real engineering practice, it is important to point out that it's virtually impossible to obtain an analytical solution to the problem. As this gear tooth model shows, the use of the photoelastic method is especially useful to analyze stress racers at re-entral corners and fillets. Tridimensional models are very useful because they enable to ascertain the stress state inside the bo loaded body. This is achieved by curing a model under the applied loads and then slicing it through different cross-sections. For real components in service, special photoelastic coatings can be used. This is a very versatile technique. The coating, called polarizing film, is applied on the component. It enables to analyze mechanical components of any size and under actual in-service conditions. Polarized light in photoelasticity. This experimental phenomenon was discovered by Sir David Brewster in 1816 who observed that when a loaded glass part is illuminated by means of polarized light, a pattern of color fringes appears. These color fringes are caused by the stresses in the mechanical part. 
1891, his ideas were con reconsidered by Wilson. In the 1920s, Ernest Cocker generalized its use with many applications in mechanical engineering. The phenomenon is based on the polarization of light combined with the use of a birefringent material. In what follows, we sum up the essential aspects. At a given point of array of light, we can interpret the natural light as an infinity of vectors normal to the ray and whose modulus varies sinusoidally with time. This is valid for both white and monochromatic light. If the light is monochromatic, all the waves will have the same wavelength in all planes. If, on the contrary, the light is white, a superposition of different wavelengths will occur in all planes. If the ray of light goes through a polarizing filter, the filter only allows the pass of light waves that occur in the polarization direction. The rest of the directions are gradually extinguished. In fact, waves in the perpendicular direction are totally extinguished. This filter is called a polarizing filter. After the filter, the light is polarized and by rotating the polarizing filter, the direction of the polarizing light changes accordingly. The, effect, the vector that defines the direction of the polarized light in the space and its amplitude will be denoted as E. If a second polarizing filter, called analyzer, is positioned across the ray path after exiting the first filter, polarizer, in such a way that both have parallel polarizing directions, then the ray of light will go through the second filter. However, if one of the filters is rotated with respect to the other, such as the filter polarizing directions for 90 degrees, then the ray of light will be totally extinguished, as shown in the picture, and no light will go through the analyzer filter. Now, we will show this phenomenon in the following video. It is known that the light reflected by a non-metallic surface, water, glass, plastic, etc., is polarized in a straight line. This polarization line is parallel to the reflected surface and therefore it is normal to the incidence plane of the ray. Therefore, if a single polarizing filter is located in such a way that the polarization direction is normal to the incidence plane of the ray, the reflection will still be visible. On the other hand, if the filter is rotated 90 degrees, the reflection will be extinguished. This effect is used in the fabrication of sunglasses, screen filters for computers, etc. In addition, this experiment enables to ascertain the polarization direction of a filter. If a polarizing filter is located on a white light source, we can only observe a slight decrease in the intensity of the transmitted light. If the filters are positioned with parallel polarizing directions, the light can go through them. But if one of them is rotated 90 degrees, the light cannot go through the filters. The birefringence phenomenon. Most of transparent materials do not modify the ray of light that goes through them, since they are isotropic materials. The light can go through the filters in all directions. Therefore, if a polarizer filter and an analyzer filter are in a cross position, no effect will be observed. However, it has been discovered that certain materials, such as nitrocellulose, backlit, and more recently polycarbonates, polyuretans or epoxy resins composites exhibit optical anisotropy. In other words, they are birefringent materials. These materials have the property of changing the direction of the polarized light depending on the applied stresses. Let's place a birefringent material between the two filters across the path followed by the ray of light. 
a bi-referencing material has two orthogonal optical axes K1 and K2. Any polarized ray in direction E that reaches the material perpendicularly, it is decomposed into two polarized rays E1 projected on K1 and E2 projected on K2. In principle, if the material is unloaded, the polarized ray E will not alter its vibration plane and will be extinguished when reaching the cross analyzer. You can see here how the ray is extinguished once reaches, once reaches the analyzer filter. Therefore, the polarized ray that reaches the bi-referenced material can be decomposed into the components E1 and E2 with respect to the two orthogonal optical axes K1 and K2. Note that the material that the ray must traverse a given thickness of material E. If the material is loaded, for example, under the action of a force F, a certain degree of bireferencence or equivalently optical anisotropy is activated that will be proportional to the applied load. Essentially, the phenomenon is due to the deformation of the internal material structure. As a consequence, one of the components advances faster than the other through the material thickness. In the figure, we can observe that the component E2 is the one that advances faster. Once the component E1 reaches the end of the material, it is recombined with the new component E2 prima, which is different to the original E2 component as a result of the out of phase advance produced inside the loaded material. Therefore, the new ray combination produces a new wave that has different orientation than the original polarized ray. Since the orientation has changed, it will not be extinguished by the crossed filter. The new wave with a different orientation will not be extinguished by the crossed filter. This new orientation varies from point to point in the material, generating the isochromatic fringes. All points that have the same local strain will cause the same variation in the exiting wave and therefore will produce the same color fringe. This aspect will be studied with further detail in next units. Finally, let's see the isochromatic lines that appear in two examples. The first is a loaded arc. The isochromatic lines can be observed they are originated by the application of a point load on the top side. The second example is a disc compressed by two opposite point loads. As can be observed, this type of contact, the so-called Hertzian contact, also leads to the isochromatic fringes. This is the end of the first unit. In forthcoming units, we will evaluate quantitatively how to ascertain the stress state of the load body.